Today's guest is Brittany Dixon, who is the CEO of Brittany and Co. She is a business strategist and a productivity coach and helps business owners implement self-care, back-end business organization systems and accountability into their business. And she does this through offers uh, for group coaching and one-on-one consulting for online service providers. So Brittany, thank you very much for being on. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm excited to dive into all of this with you because every time I get somebody uh, that is very, you know, organized and they have all their like T's and I's crossed and like it's what they help people do. I know that they're going to be really good at speaking and like giving me the articulate answers, but then the real stuff is like where they don't <laughs> want to look. So <laughs> yep. I'm always excited when somebody like yourself comes on, but awesome. regardless, uh, I'd love for you to dive into how you got to doing uh, what you're doing and what your business is all about. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm actually an accidental entrepreneur. Um, never in a million years did I think I was going to start a business. I have no business entrepreneurship in my family. I actually grew up in a really low income family. So, um, I actually, when I dove in and got started in my career, I worked in hospitality and food service, and then I wanted to be a wedding planner. Cause I thought that'd be really cool. Um, I was that weird 16 year old with like color coded binders and labels and people thought I was always weird. So I was like, how can I transition this into a career? <laughs> um, so yeah, I started doing the wedding planning and then I actually worked for a corporate, um, restaurant doing the marketing and event planning. And I was there for about four years. And in 2016, I'm trying to think back to the timeline, I actually got let go. So about nine months prior to that, there was some shifting going on. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to start a business. <laughs> as a side hustle. Um, so I actually had started a home organizing company because I'm a mom of twins and I had a lot of twin mom friends who are like, I can't even function in like my house because it's so crazy chaotic. So I was like, I'm going to start a side hustle and I'm going to help you organize. So I ended up getting promoted. Nothing happened with that for about nine months. And then when I got let go, um, they actually, I was like, well, I have the side hustle, I guess let's start a business. So kind of dove into that, had no clue what I was doing. Um, about six months into it, I decided to hire a business coach. And then she showed me this online space and she's like, you could totally teach business owners, like the productivity, the organization, that side of things and have a bigger impact because you can reach clients worldwide instead of just in Columbus, Ohio. So that kind of got me down the rabbit hole of the online business space. And then I started a podcast. I've got group coaching. I do consulting. Um, and here we are today. That's, uh, as far as accidental entrepreneurship stories go, yeah. that's a pretty good one. <laughs> like I stumbled into, you know, my like zone of genius <laughs> right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, and it was, I, I organized events and then I organized houses. So it just made sense to organize businesses, to have a bigger impact. And so when somebody showed me that I could do that in the online space, I was like, all right, let's try this out. <laughs> Love it. So, okay. In that case, uh, given that you've had this, you know, successful run kind of stumbling into yeah. the, the things that you're good at, and then seeing that you can monetize that, what is the business ceiling or the business challenge that you're experiencing yeah. right now? Yeah. So I essentially, once I finally got into the business, so it took about a year to like figure out what I was doing for businesses. And then once I finally figured that out and really like rebranded and got everything kind of situated and, and buttoned up, um, I actually hit six figures in 14 months. So it was pretty quick. I had systems in place for it. I was doing a couple different offers. Um, and then the next year I also hit a little bit more than that and was still in the six figures. And we're talking like you know, the hundred thousand dollars, we're not talking multi six figures. Um, and then the next year I had a little bit more than that, but I feel like I'm just like stuck. Like I can't get past this $110,000 a year mark. Um, and I have all the systems I've got the offers I've got the proven methods. I've got things in place. Like I've got all the stuff and I just like, something is just not working. Something is just not clicking. Um, and I've started to dive into, we were talking before the recording, some of the, you know, personal stuff and therapy and childhood traumas that are probably in the way I'm sure. Uh, so I, I do, I am starting to realize that's probably what it is because everything else is there. So <laughs> that's where we're at. Beautiful. Well, as I told you, even then, uh, you're in the right place to yeah. explore this. So, okay. So you just make sure that I've heard you correctly. Right. So yeah. you're in this place right now where 
all of the pieces that need to be in place to scale beyond that like low six figures are in place but because you uh don't want to pull the trigger on that on some level it's kind of like stuck and and you're starting to see layers of where your own friction is contributing to that yeah 100 percent. and i want to work less (laughs) less, <laughs> right? The American dream. We want to work less. And I feel like I am just in constant hustle mode. So then that triggers imposter syndrome because I have a program called hustle to flow. So how can I teach that if I'm still in hustle mode? So there's a lot of that coming up. Um, but yeah, I just, I can't get past this point, right? Like I, I can keep it going and I'm still on track this year to keep it going, to hit that, but it, I'm just stuck. And, um, it's definitely, I think it's definitely a mean problem for sure. Got it. So before we dive into those aspects, if we can just kind of zoom out and look at, okay. So being stuck where you're at and not really working or experiencing the freedom level that you want to experience, how is this impacting like your life in general. For sure. Um, and I will say I have really good boundaries and time management being a systems person. So like I do take Fridays off almost every single week. So I think I have time freedom, but at the cost of not having as much money freedom (laughs) that I want. So it's definitely impacting some of the things me and my family want to do. We want to be able to buy a new RV and like take a whole year off to be able to just travel the entire United States. We've thought about living in an RV before. Um, we're not like, I'm actually a minimalist. So like material things do not do it for me. I would literally just travel every single day of the year. And I feel like kind of, I have the job that will allow me to do that. Right. If I can retire my husband and he can come along, but I just can't get it to a point that we would be able to do that comfortably. Got it. Okay. So basically it's like rippling into the, the, the relationships and the experiences they want to have with the people that yeah. are closest to me. For sure. For okay. sure. Yep. Cause there's Got just it. that financial stress of like, which thing should we do? And can we afford vacations and things like that? And the, I, I, like I said, I grew up low income family. Like I want out of that so, so bad. <laughs> right. So missing that choice, right? Yeah. Like I, right now the choices are still based off of what it is I can or cannot afford as opposed yeah. to, I just want to have the choice to do what it is that I want to do. Yes. Okay. Got yes, it. For sure. So one of the things that like I observed with you is like, you're very self-aware, right? Like it, it, this is not your first rodeo into diving into these types of topics. So you mentioned imposter syndrome one time already. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the things that you have identified in yourself that are kind of contributing to all of this? Um, yeah, so definitely, I mean, the imposter syndrome is huge. I think social media doesn't help with that. Right. I see people that do what I do that are doing way better than I am. And I'm like, Oh, I can't, I can't compare to that. So that's huge. Um, a lot of just money mindset blocks because I know my stuff is valuable but I still get like super anxious when I'm selling, um, or when somebody asks how much my program is and I'm like, Oh, it's (laughs) $2,000 and it should be more, right? Like I know that it should be more, but I've also had struggles selling it at that price point. So I'm like, how am I going to sell it for more if I can't even sell it at this price point? Right. Uh, so definitely some money mindset issues. Marketing has never been like, I've never been a person that loves marketing. Um, So I think I've got a lot of blocks around that because it's just like putting yourself out there, right? (laughs) Like I'm very good at putting out information and education and workflows and tips, but sharing the personal stuff and the failures, definitely not something I am great at hitting on emotions in my marketing. Definitely not my jam. (laughs) I'm like, here's the checklist and here's how you do it. Like, just go do it. And they're like, oh, cool. That doesn't sound fun. I'm like, all right. <laughs> um, so yeah, my, I think my content definitely suffers and then in turn, I'm sure has a ripple effect on not being able to have sales too. So. Got it. So there's an aspect of authenticity, right? Like if I show up as the authentic Brittany, that doesn't really feel safe, but yes, if I have to show up as a smart Brittany, like I'm all in, we can yep. do the thing. Right. Yes. Yep. Okay. Got it. Um, you had mentioned being super anxious, uh, when selling. Okay. Any other emotions that pop up whenever 
like you're thinking about your business or, or selling in general? Yeah. Um, I think I just don't want to come off as pushy and salesy. Um, and I don't know if that's because I've had that, like, I've had that happen to me where they're like, Hey, buy the thing. And I'm like, Oh, that feels terrible. <laughs> uh, so I don't, I just don't want to come off as pushy or salesy. The anxiety comes up and then the imposter syndrome every time too. It's like, Oh, who am I to charge $3,000? Like that's, I made that in like an entire month before when I was working, like, how can I charge that for one package? Um, so I think it's definitely just, again, back to money mindset stuff that comes up too. Got it. And what are the day-to-day patterns that you see that result from all of this? Um, I avoid sales and marketing like the plague. (laughs) I'm like, oh, I need to go sell and follow up with people. Cool. I'm going to go organize my sauna instead. And I'm going to create project plans or I'm going to go watch Netflix. Uh, so definitely procrastinating on doing the sales piece or finding other things that are not revenue producing that sound like more fun. Okay. So finding other revenue things or non-revenue. Non-revenue. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to just like eliminate the hemorrhaging from that one thing, do you think that would increase your business? Stop the hemorrhage from like not doing revenue producing activities. Right. Cause you said, okay, like, uh, I, I, it's like, I, I know I need to do marketing and sales type things, but they absolutely make me feel sick. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to go organize something that probably doesn't really need a lot of organizing or nope. like reorganizing <laughs> and or watch Netflix. So uh-huh. like cumulatively, even if that was like a relatively low figure, like five hours a week, yep. if you were to just stop the hemorrhaging of that five hours per week and reallocate it towards revenue producing things, do you think that would have an impact on your bottom line? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And if you had to put a number on it, what do you think it might be? And it could be a range, doesn't it? You don't have to yeah. give me like specifics. Um, I mean, honestly, like, so one sale of my program is 2000. One sale of my VIP days is at least three to 5,000, depending on what it is. So even one person, <laughs> anywhere from two to $5,000. Right. And that's potentially per week, right? Like if we say that yeah. was like per week, I don't hemorrhage yeah. on all these useless activities that could be at a minimum $2,000 a week, yeah. which is 8,000 a month, yes. which is basically your next hundred K. Right. <laughs> so, um, the reason that I'm asking these questions is just to kind of get the lay of the land and the severity yeah. of what's up front. So how does like, what, what comes out for you when I share that? I know what I need to do. I've got all the systems for it. I've got tasks that tell me to do it. I've got a CRM that gives me all the people. Um, I don't know. It's just doing it and not feeling the anxiety around it. Um, and putting myself out, I think on social media and marketing authentically and not the perfect, like polished checklist kind of girl. (laughs) Um, yeah. So I, I think a lot of just fear around, I think I honestly have some fear of success too, to be honest, because then what if it all comes crumbling down kind of situation? Um, so yeah, I, I know the things and for some reason I just don't do the things. (laughs) Absolutely. So in that instance, right. So you got the anxiousness when selling, you got the visibility, right. And the anxiousness around the visibility you got the fear of success, because I don't know if I can hold this level of success before I crumble it down. So I might as well keep it smaller. Yep. Right. Yep. (laughs) Anything else from what you can or have observed so far? Um, I mean, I think those are definitely the main ones. I think the fear too, of like, if I get really big, I have to have a gigantic team to be able to support it. And I don't know that I want a gigantic team that I have to manage, but again, that comes down to me feeling like I have to manage them, right? Someone else can manage them. Um, so I think that is part of it too, of like, oh, cool. If I just say small, like I don't have to manage all the other moving pieces. And I know just from what I do, obviously more people 
more processes that are needed, more systems that are needed, more problems that come up. So I'm sure that's a piece of it too, knowing that there's other things that need to be put in place to make it bigger. And what's your relationship like to responsibility? Um, I have, I had to be responsible pretty much from the time I was 16 on, I had my own job and I was the oldest of five. So I had to help with the siblings and I moved out when I was 18 and had to go to college and work two jobs to pay rent and eat ramen noodles. (laughs) So I've always had to be the responsible one for sure. And what was your experience of that? Like to yourself, like, is that something you were proud of something you liked, something you thought was just the burden you had to deal with? Like, well, what was your experience with it? Um, I think probably a little bit of all of that, actually. Like I felt like it was a burden when I was a kid and like 16, 17, 18, 19, that I had to do that. And a lot of my friends didn't have to. And then I think it turned into something I was proud of. Like I did this and I did it by myself and I can do anything by myself kind of thing. Um, so I would say it's a little, a little bit of both. Okay. And that sense of responsibility, when you look at growing a team, does that reflect the feeling of when you were younger or no? Um, I mean, maybe a little, I think that I think I've had to be responsible for so long and be in charge of all the things that it's exhausting and I want to pass it off, but then I'm scared to pass it off that it's not going to get done correctly. Got it. And what if it's not done correctly? Then my image comes into play and it doesn't look good. (laughs) All of those things. It's all the stuff that like circles back. Um, And I have started to pass off some control and responsibility of things, but I feel like I do still always circle back and I'm like, oh, did you do it? Which completely defeats the purpose of someone doing it is circling back to see if they did it correctly. (laughs) Okay. And, uh, the control aspect of that, what does that mean about you? Um, I think that. I mean, I feel like I need to be in control to make my image look good and be perfect and show up how people want me to show up. And that if I'm not, that things could crumble and fall down and come apart and everything I've worked really, really, really hard for will be gone. Um, So scared that it's all just going to disappear if I'm not in control of it. Right. So basically the responsibility is on you as the eldest to make sure that everything and everything stays together. Otherwise you are the bad one. Yes. Okay. And how does that feel? Like I've got some tightness going on in my chest right now. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you tune into that tightness, like what's the actual feeling? Um, I'm just anxious about it because I think I am on this cusp of like, I want to give up control and I want to have a team doing things. And I want to be able to get to this point of financial freedom that I don't have to work as much and I can still provide. And I think I'm just like right there in being able to do that. And something is just holding me back. Got it. So why is it not safe to let go of control? Because it all come crumbling down. <laughs> okay. Because I've had to hold it together. And it's, it's like that to even just like our household, right? Like my husband does a ton of stuff, but like from a financial aspect, I'm the one in charge of that and making sure bills get paid and making sure doctor's appointments, like all, a lot of that responsibility is on me too. So I feel like I've got these two containers, business life on top of me and I'm in charge of all of it. And if I let one of them crumble, the other one's going to crumble too. Um, so I feel like I've just always had to be the one holding it together. So I just don't see another way of someone else being able to do that. Got it. So the belief is very much, I have to hold it together. Yes. Okay. If I don't hold it together, then fill in the blank. I don't I don't know (laughs) because I've always had to be the one to hold together together. So I think there's just this complete unknown of like, I don't know what that feels like and looks like it's completely like this 
black hole that I have no idea what's, what would exist if that's how it was to be. Okay. And what's so scary about that black hole? It's completely new. <laughs> it's completely unknown. It's a completely different way of living. Um, I think I would have to get get rid of an old self and be a, a new person, which is terrifying. <laughs> well, would you have to get rid of a whole new self or would you just have to live from a different belief? Probably just live from different beliefs. Right. Because right now, the overarching belief is I have to hold it all together. To the degree that the world does not exist and it is a black hole with the deepest of abysses that if I don't hold it all together, it like doesn't just like get inconvenienced. It completely and utterly falls apart. It is the death of everything. Yeah. How does that feel when I reflect that back? Yeah, no, you, that you hit it straight on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So great answer, but doesn't really answer how you actually feel. <laughs> um, I've never been good at change. And I think, I think I, I know this, right? Like I know something has to change. Um, I think just letting go of an old self and an old set of beliefs and having a completely new one is terrifying. Um, what if I lose relationships that I've had that were super close to me because of old self? Um, what if I lose family members, which is a thing? Um, yeah, I think it's just the fear of the unknown of like, will my life completely change if this happens in bad ways? Like it'll change in good ways. Right. But what are the bad ways that come along with that? hundred percent. And that's great observation and great awareness around the actual issue. So is it so much that I will, um, like change versus I'm actually going to lose my identity and everything that I know? Probably the second one. Okay. Yeah. So that gives you a more solvable problem, right? This is a loss of identity, a loss of self, much more than it is about a fear of change. Because anybody that quote unquote accidentally stumbles into a new business and makes it successful within the first 14 months isn't exactly somebody that is deathly afraid of change. That's yeah, that's, that's a good observation for sure. Right. So when you were younger and you had to take on this responsibility quite early on, that identity of, I have to hold it all together, wasn't just critical for your own survival, but it was critical, it seems like, for your siblings as well. Yep. So in this instance, do you see how the same pattern is now playing out in your business? 100%. (laughs) Got it. Yep. So same question again, then what's coming up for you internally? I just, I felt a sense of calm. I think even just you saying loss of identity versus scared of change. Okay. That's interesting. So (laughs) tell me more about that. I think just, I like knowing that I'm a planner, right? Like I like, I like planning and I like, if we have the thing that we need to do and we know that that's the problem, I can put a plan in place and it'll have all the dots on the eyes and the T's crossed and it'll be all organized in a sauna. But I feel like I can't do that a lot of times because I'm like, I don't even know what, I don't know what the problem is. I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm doing the, some of the marketing I'm doing some of the things I'm fulfilling. People are happy. Like, so I think that just getting the plan together by knowing the thing and the the clarity is what helps me move forward. The clarity of the plan or the clarity of the issue? clarity of the issue. Okay. Cause I think once I know what the thing is and what we need to do, then I, the plan just comes naturally. My fingers create this giant project plan on Asana with all the tasks and all the due dates. <laughs> right. Okay. So in this instance, 
you have the clarity that one of the beliefs is I have to hold it all together. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan now to overcome that? Well, so when I was saying that I was meaning more on the business side, creating those plans, these ones are a little harder for me. Um, (laughs) but one of those action items I feel like would be is to like, what thing can I do to, I guess, like reverse that belief? Like what are the action steps I need to do? Do I, I don't know, meditate mantras, visualize, like, what does that look like? Um, and kind of diving into that. So I guess I don't have a really great plan for this. <laughs> and how does that make you feel? Uh, very anxious. Actually, I just got really sweaty. Um, I'm like, I don't know what to say now. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's where we're at. Perfect. So first of all, it was a great <laughs> observation. Uh, number two, right? As soon as you're prompted to go into the messiness, in yep. this instance, emotions, because uh-huh. they don't fit the mold, they don't fit the checklist, they don't fit the plan. What happens to your body? You have a very it. physiological yeah. panic trauma type reaction. 100%. Because if you can't be in control, if you can't hold it all together, that means a complete death of not just your core identity, but also as the provider for these other people in your life, right? There's a lot of somatic energy associated with that belief. Yes. Okay. So what's coming up for you when I share that? Um, I feel a little bit better, but still, I think just anxiety and like, I feel tense still just like thinking what is the next step? What is the action? Cause I am an action taker, but again, not having that clarity of knowing what that action is, I think just makes me super anxious. Yep. And understandable given like you have a very rigid quality about you, or there's like a, like a rigid personality type, um, that you embody more or less to a T and the biggest issue issue in, in, in air quotes, because there's a lot of gifts to this uh, personality type as well, is the onus on the process is always higher than the onus on self-trust. In your instance, they're very intimately related, but it's like, I trust myself to the extent that I trust the plan and the process I have around it as soon as that disappears and I am left in the void of uncertainty and the mess, that's where I begin to crumble and completely like, how do I trust myself in something that I can't checklist my way out of? Yes. (laughs) Right. Welcome to the wonderful world of emotions. (laughs) All right. And I know I'm making jokes with it. It's just to kind of like allow you to to relieve some of that um, tension, but what comes up for you when I share that? Yeah. I'm, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, I don't know that anything's really coming up other than it makes sense. Perfect. Um, the other part that I wanted to touch on as well is in the visibility bit, right? Because what's asking and what wants to merge out of your business is, well, I have to show up authentically and as me. And if I show up authentically and as me, then if there are comments, then they are towards the messiness of me. They're not to the checklist, which I know I got down pat. So how does that like land for you? Yeah, no, I mean, and I think that, and I've shared a lot of my personal life on social media and I have shared some stuff, but I think there's still just this barrier that I'm like, they can see a little tiny bit of it, but not all of this, like they can't see all of this. Um, so I think that's, it's definitely been a huge barrier because I think that's why a lot of people just don't connect. They're like, oh, she's too perfect. So I'm not going to follow her system because I don't have my stuff together. Like she does. And I've actually had some of my students say that, like, I'll share more with my students than I'll share with social media. So like in our, you know, 
safe container of our group coaching. Um, I definitely share more with them than I do on the outside world. And like, I'll share some messy stuff and they're like, oh my gosh, you're not perfect. What? This is amazing. (laughs) So again, my brain knows that I need to do this and that that's how people connect. And it's just this like, "Mm, but I'm going to stay in my safe little bubble. It's fine. (laughs) So if you were to go live right now and share the messiness of this conversation, what would that feel like? Um, very uncomfortable. (laughs) Um, yeah, I would have anxiety on what to say and what to talk about and how to do it. And it's not in an outline. So just off the cuff and they're going to think that I'm crazy. I don't know. A lot of anxiety comes up. What if you did do it, do it right now? I mean, we technically are, right? I mean, it's not live, live. Someone's going to hear it. <laughs> I mean, like, because you're on your computer. If yeah. you were to take your phone and do a live right now and just share the messiness of the moment, would you be open to doing that? Oh, that sounds real uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't meant to be a, a fun invitation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you're welcome to say no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm throwing it out there as, uh, you know, Cause you said you did this whole thing to be uncomfortable for 31 days. I so did. Yeah. Can that be if, my, can that be my day number seven tomorrow to go live and share about it? Uh, I'm not going to force you obviously <laughs> to do this right now, but if you're willing to do it tomorrow, why not just do it right now for a minute? Oh man. <laughs> All right. You're, All you're, right. Make, you're making me do this here. <laughs> All right, let's let's. I see told you which, you're gonna get which... the most out of this experience. <laughs> <laughs> see, and my brain goes straight to what do I say? How do I start? What I know things that's am exactly I... why I'm telling you to do it right now. Because if I left it for like, if I know you would have done it tomorrow, but then it would have been like checklist. It would have been like, very say this, 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 and this. Correct. But like, what do I do? I just go on there. At, at, Correct. Yeah, this you is, just press this is... go. Just and press go, go live, on live. Okay. And you shared the messiness of this moment. I'm not going to tell you what you need to say. You just share whatever it is that comes to mind. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. My heart is pounding right now. <laughs> I I believe you. And I acknowledge and you. And I go live. I go live. I go live. I do this. But they're very, they're very plain and meticulous. Okay. So I just go on there and tell them that I'm doing this. And... Just press go and go. Okay. Oh, why is this so difficult? All right, it's going. Oh, no. Now it's it's checking connection. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Hopefully you're having an awesome day. Um, so I'm doing something really, really, really uncomfortable right now. It actually took me, I don't know, like 30 seconds to hit go live on here. Um, I am on a coaching call diving into, um, emotional blocks and trauma things and, uh, why I can't hit the next revenue block or revenue milestone in my business. And, um, I'm sweating right now. So there's that. And, uh, yeah, that's where we're at all the uncomfortable things. So follow along if you want to see more. Oh, and we're still, yeah, we're still live. There we go. We're going to hit end now. Okay. Shared. Okay. It's It's there. Oh my gosh. I'm sweating. (laughs) Well, first and And foremost, congratulations. It is now out on the internet. So there's that. (laughs) Well, okay. So first and foremost, congratulations. I want to acknowledge you you for uh, doing a deep dive into this experience. Um, Yep. You're actually the second person I made to do this <laughs> when right. the visibility issue right. popped up. So uh, just know that you're in good company. Awesome. Um, so allow yourself to just, you know, exhale, breathe. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it is over. Uh, what's the feeling internally having done that? Um, that I want to go delete it right this second. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why? Um because it was unscripted, not planned and very messy. Okay. And what does that mean about you? That someone's going to judge me and be like, why the heck did she just put that out on the internet? And why should I follow her? And why should I trust her to grow my business? Perfect. And in this moment right now, who's doing the judging? Me. (laughs) Right. Because nobody else here. And I've been applauding you the whole time. So there's, that leaves only one person to judge, right? So that judgment of 
this is messy. I shouldn't trust this person to, to, you know, coach me to do these things. That's part of the judgment and the narrative that lives inside you. Yep. That's the lens through which you're going to make a lot of future visibility decisions that are getting in the way of you actually expanding that. So yep. the question to you then is, what would you have to believe about yourself to judge yourself in that way? Um, that I am very capable of doing this and I'm very capable of helping people grow their business and that I can do it messy and still be really good at what I do. And it's not going to affect my work. Um, that I, yeah, I mean, I think really just trusting myself that I'm on this path for a reason and I'm really good at what I do and I can help so many people if I just get out of my own way. And that's a beautiful reframe and a better story to tell. The original question was, what would you have to believe to judge yourself and to tell yourself the things that you said at the beginning, which was, who am I to actually teach this business when I'm showing up in such a messy way? Yeah. So can you repeat the question then? Right. So if your default is to judge yourself, mm -hmm. what would you have to believe as the default belief to produce that judgment about yourself? That, uh, I don't know if I'm understanding correctly, um, sure. that I am capable of doing this. Okay. So let me rephrase it then. Okay. If right now the narrative is, yes, I can't show up in a messy way because that shows incompetence in me. So people will witness that as I can't help them grow their business. What do you have to believe about yourself to judge yourself in that way? Does that make sense? Or do you want to rephrase it a different way? I think so. I think I'm trying to do like the opposite of what you're saying. So like you saying Correct. that I would have said that I need to believe that I am able to show up messy and still be capable of what I Correct. do. That's the reframe. Okay. I'm yeah. saying, what's the present reality? Like the one that, like, it was just two of us here. You never checked any comments if there even were any, and I was celebrating you the whole time, but your brain went to like full on judgment. I can't believe you did this. You should be ashamed of yourself. How could you show up in that messy way? Right. So my question to you is, what do you have to believe about yourself to instigate that level of self-talk? That I'm not worthy. Okay. Of what? Success. And why is that? Um, I think it comes down to like me growing up poor and seeing that. And then like, who am I to make money growing up like that? Who am I to get out of that, to, um, leave my family behind by being successful and getting the things that I want and why am I worth that? Right. Because if I leave my family behind with success, now I have to project that I'm quote unquote better than them. And I now, heard that I heard that yeah. a lot when I was growing up. Yeah. So not only am I then kicked out of this tribe, but then I also have to get into spaces where it's like, I'm not the one who actually needs to be responsible for everyone and everything anymore. Right. Cause I'm actually making a lot of money and other people are doing it for me. It feels uncomfortable to actually just let that go and receive. Yes. Right. So now you're getting into the layers that are basically enmeshing one over the other. Yep. Okay. And what comes up for you when I share that? What's the plan? What are my checklist items to fix it? <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing that comes up. Right. What's the actual feeling? Um, I think, I think there's relief, like knowing that if you dig back far enough in the layers that it can be fixed and that I can 
have this successful business and still have all the things that I want my family. Um, so I think I do feel some relief of like, you can dig all the layers back to create the plan and action items to fix things. We just have to do some digging. Correct. So yeah, I mean, just to answer your question a bit more directly, the first part is always removing the limiting self, right? So right now we're kind of creating a tally of all of the limiting narratives, limiting emotions and limiting patterns, right? So basically how I think, feel and act to get the ceiling that I'm getting right now. There's a lot of stories for you. The emotions you tend to avoid, right? Like you're, you, you're safer in your head than you are in your body and emotions. So you tend to bypass those, which is why I asked Uh you multiple times, multiple different instances, but what are you actually feeling? That's a great answer, but what are you actually feeling? Right. Um, And then the actions that result from like, for example, you identified one pattern, which is, you know, I spend a lot of time avoiding revenue producing things, which the simplest one could literally give me a hundred K this year extra. Right. So number one is removing that limiting self. The number two is really building your up-leveled self. So how do I now go? And given the removal and the clean slate that that gives me, how do I now begin to rebuild myself and my new identity? What are the new thoughts, feelings, and actions that I need to do consistently? How do I self-regulate when I get uncomfortable in my bigness? How do I do more courageous actions that are directly aligned to creating a new internal identity, a new paradigm, much like the live exercise you just did, right? Because you did that exercise with an external force, in this instance, myself, prompting you to do it. It's better than nothing, but it's very fragile because it's not self-directed. It's not, I am at peace with wanting to share my most authentic self, so I'm going to exercise the courage to do it on my own it's i'm doing it within this container and that's fine as a first step but right. as far as like building your up leveled self it's a matter of stepping up with courage to align with the new story and the new vision right and then really number three is mastering all of that into a new normal where it's not conscious that I'm pushing myself and tracking, you know, what it is that I'm doing here to becomes my new normal. And that's really allowing your nervous system to be at peace with, you know, I am at peace with success. I, I logically understand nobody's going to ostracize me. And if they do, that's fine. I want to feel that in my body as like neutral or potentially even excited. So yeah. I know that was kind of a lot thrown your way, but does all of that make yeah, sense? No, that makes total sense. Perfect. And does anything come up for you when I share those pieces? Well, you put it in a one, two, three checklist. So (laughs) that's true. Actually, I did. You're right. You did. You did. So (laughs) I think it helps my brain be like, okay, cool. These are the next steps. Do it. (laughs) Absolutely. Perfect. So in that case, like, does this feel complete for you or is it still something left outstanding? No, I think that feels good. Um, I mean, obviously there's more onion layers to peel lots of them, but um, definitely some really good insights for sure. Beautiful. So in that case, why don't you just let everybody know in your own words, like, what did you come into this conversation with, um, you know, anticipating or thinking was your business challenge or business ceiling. And then what were your takeaways and aha moments as a result of the conversation? Yeah. So I came in thinking that my marketing, that I just need to do more marketing and give me some tips for how to do better marketing and came away with, um, yeah, we're going to peel back some onion layers. (laughs) We're going to, we're going to have to do the deep work and then it'll translate into the marketing easier without having to force it. Beautiful. Well, in that case, uh, if you can then just close this off, let everybody know who's the best person to find you, where can they find you floor is yours for that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I work with online service providers, typically people that are getting ready to bring on a virtual assistant or a team member who really need to get some systems in place in order to pass off and delegate work. Um, 
you can go to our, our website, which is bcohq.co and we do one-on-one consulting and then we have a hustle to flow group coaching program if you're looking for that. So all the options. Beautiful. Well, we'll include all of those in the show notes as always. Awesome. Uh, Brittany, thank you very much for coming on, Absolutely. being vulnerable and courageous uh, both at the same time. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. And uh, for everybody else listening, we'll see you on the next one.